Welcome to the Pinelander Podcast, the official podcast of Pineland, broadcasting to you from an undisclosed location deep inside Pineland, where we discuss faith, family, finances, firearms, freedom, food, and everything else in between with those who believe in living free and living out the values that made this country free. Welcome to the Pine Leonard Podcast. This is Paula Favor, and you're listening to the podcast for America's Warriors. My counterpart, Mike Blackburn, is once again deployed to Africa on special assignment. I'm sure he's going to have some juicy stuff to talk about once he, when he uh, gets back. Uh, today is Friday, the 5th of July, 2024, and in this episode, in celebration of our nation's 248th birthday, we're talking about faith, war, God, and honor with retired Major Jim Gant of the Special Forces. Jim enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1986, went to the Q course, and became an 18 Echo, and took part in Operation Desert Storm in 1991. Later, he became an officer, went back to the Q course to become an 18 Alpha, then he went on to lead Special Forces detachments in Afghanistan and in Iraq, serving over four years in combat was wounded seven times, and was awarded the Silver Star. Demonstrating his worth to the war effort, General Petraeus once called Jim the perfect counterinsurgent. In addition to these well-earned accolades, Jim fears God, hates evil, and loves America. Major Gant, welcome, sir. Hey, Paul, thank you so much. It's, uh, it, is, it is an honor to be here. Uh, with you today. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I had, uh, and it's, uh, you're a guy that uh, uh, is uh, currently you're on the other side of the world. Uh, and I know we have a major time difference. Uh, but something that we've been uh, kicking down the, the field for a long time on this podcast is um, really for this, the guys going through the Q course. In large measure, it's about what it means to serve, uh, what it means to be an American, um, and you know what Mike and I often talk about is what led us to want to be part of the special forces. And uh, so, uh, I can't think of a better way to to start this podcast uh, a day after uh, the Fourth of July than to just ask you some questions that are geared towards the special forces and, and your time in the regiment. And uh, so uh, maybe just to break the ice, I wanted to ask you, you know, what made you want to become a Green Beret? Yeah, it, uh, it actually started. It's, it's, it's actually a funny, pretty funny story. Um, It started when I was in, in junior high, a uh, couple of different different things. I I was a, a pretty good athlete, and I uh, because I was a pretty good athlete, I you know kind of became a, a leader in 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 my my sports, you know my teams, and um, so I I kind of uh, I, I kind of that's where I learned. My dad taught me, hey, if you want to be good at something, you you have to put in the time. You have to put in the effort. You have to put in the energy. You have to work harder than everyone else. And I, I kind of learned that at a, at a young age due to athletics. Mm. And when I was around a sophomore in high school, uh, ninth grader, 10th grader, a couple of things happened. Believe it or not, I went and saw the movie Rambo. Ah, nice. And I- Thought to myself, that is a badass dude. <laughs> I want to, I want to be like that. No doubt. And it was, uh, it was, it was at that time that um, I started to look, look. I started doing reading. I loved reading. I've always loved reading ever since I was young. And I read uh, the Green Berets by Robin Moore. Mm. And I fantastic, absolutely. Book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just absolutely fell in love with the concept of just that 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 close in 
knife to knife, hand to hand, man to man battle. Like there was something about that that just that just really resonated with me. Mm. And I so that kind of stuck into my mind. I hadn't got out of high school yet. And then um, I graduated high school and I had several basketball scholarships. And I just none, none of it just really just really I almost had an epiphany uh, where I realized that that playing basketball was not something that I was going to be able to do for the, the rest of my life and uh, kind of started looking around for other options. And my dad was like, hey, son, you can look around for all the options you want, but come August, you're out of here, man. <laughs> you're out of here. So, nice. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm appreciative for that. I mean, you know what I mean? I don't know if that happens I- anymore. And I had actually gotten a, a, a book down at, well, I lived real close to a u- used bookstore, and it was a, a larger book, and it was about the Vietnam War. Mm. And it had a lot of different pictures and different things, and it actually had a section on the Navy SEALs. And there was a section on, you know, the Green Berets and different things. And it just kind of occurred to me, hey, what about joining the military? Mm. And it's not something that I had that I really had had in my mind at 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 any time. Um, but then it, it kind of, you know, I said, wait, let, let me let me kind of check this out. So I I looked around at different things. And at that time, I wasn't, you know, I'm, I'm 18, 19 years old. Like I'm not I'm not really attuned what the differences are between the Navy SEALs and the Green yeah. Berets. I just see these cool pictures and these badass dudes, you know, and I'm like, hey, I, I think I can do that. And um, this is the God's honest truth. And I've actually heard one other guy say something very similar to this. Um, I actually went to the Navy recruiter first. No way. And I I did. <laughs> I walked in. And I said, hey, I, I want to be a Navy SEAL. Wow. And... Um, the response was, uh, was one of giggling and laughter. And it was just, it, it, it you know, even, even for a, a young Jim Gann at 18 years old, it kind of pissed me off a little bit, yeah. you know, and I literally went, walked out of there, went right next door, walked in and, uh, uh, told the recruiter I wanted to, to be a green beret. And he said, well, have a seat. Yeah. And so that that actually that actually started the the, the journey right there. Wow. And uh, and from, you know, from from there, everything, everything just broke, broke really, really well for me in in my in my uh, in my early military career. And uh, that's that's how it got started. Wow. I think. Uh... You know, at least you knew that the Green Berets and the Special Forces was the same thing. Uh, funny little story for me is I didn't know that, and I just as I was a, uh, uh, in a I was a Bradley crewman, and I just figured out, hey, this isn't working out for me. And I heard about, you know, hey, the Special Forces, and I thought, okay, but I had no idea that it was the same thing. But at least sounds like, you know, that's that's really silly, right? Uh, and, you know, when I found that out, I was in a formation uh, on Smoke Bomb Hill, and I saw the guys, you know, with their headgear, and I was like, oh, okay. Uh, but yeah. it, it sounded like you uh, actually had this figured out. Uh, I've been thinking about this a lot lately is, uh, you know, some people, they just don't have their crap together, you know, until they're a little bit older. But it's not like you really knew what you wanted to do, you know, at that age. I mean, and that's, yeah, that's, uh, that's, I think in some sense, an anomaly, you know, some people just plot through college. They don't even know what they want to do. They're just doing this to figure out what they want. And, you know, like me, that was me. I joined the military. I didn't really know what I wanted to be. And then I just kind of fell into, uh, you know, through the process of, gosh, I really want to serve in a place that's, that's elite and, and guys that, you know, like you said, up close and personal work, you know, knife edge work. And, uh, and I found that in the special forces. And I think that's interesting that you, you know, you had, you already knew 
you know, pointedly what you wanted to do. I think that's that's very interesting, an anomaly. Um, yeah, well, I like like you said, I, I for sure, uh, I, I didn't join the military because I had to or I, I didn't have any other options. I, I had I had several other options, but for sure, I joined the army to become a Green Beret. Like mm. that was that was my goal. It wasn't to to do to do anything to do anything other than that. I will I will say, um, as 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 I got into it, and and I actually went to the uh, second class. It wasn't even SFAS. They called it SFOT. Oh wow! And um, I can honestly say that the only reason I was able to get through that was I just didn't know better. I didn't know how bad it sucked. You know, I, I, I showed up in really, really, really fantastic condition, but um, I was I was not mentally prepared for how difficult that was going to be. And I tell people all the time, like that was a one shot deal for me. I I, I uh, um, when I just when I think back on it, uh um, I, I, I don't know that, that, uh, like I said, the only reason I was able to pass that was because I just didn't, I didn't realize how bad it sucked at the time. Cause I was just a, a, yeah. a, you know, just a young trooper out there. And, uh, when I think back on those times, it's, it's actually pretty funny for me. Yeah. Hey, so I have, uh, I wonder if we could share this with uh, our listeners is, uh, the time you went through Robin Sage, uh, as an 18 echo. Uh, and I remember you sharing this, uh, you know, you, we all have those experiences in the Q course that just kind of stick out in our minds, but I think you have one that's pretty colorful. I wonder if you would share that. Yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, I did not, I did not have a lot of, of, of experience when I showed up for the, for the Q course. As a matter of fact, just maybe as an interesting note, um, uh, the fifth group command sergeant major, command sergeant major Dennison. Right when I, I don't know why I ended up in his office, but I ended up in his office, and he, you know, hey, what, what the hell are you doing here, Gant? And I'm like, well, you know, I want to, I want to go to the Q course. And he said, yeah, everybody wants to go to the Q course. So what, what makes you think that? So we, we go back and forth. He said, Hey, I want, I want you to play on the, on the, the group basketball team. And I was like, so major, if I wanted to play basketball, I'd be playing basketball. And it. So we went back and forth yeah. and finally he, he said to me, now keep in mind, this is, this is 1987, early wow. 88, something like that. He said, Hey, okay. If you make it through Sears school, mm. I will send you to this new selection program that they have and i i give you my word i didn't even know what sears school <laughs> i didn't even know what that was oh boy <laughs> and i was like roger that and so you can imagine 19 years i did not even know when i went back to my little office and told them their jaws dropped and they're like dude dude yeah do you know what you're getting and, you into know, <laughs> oh man and you know, and and it's neither here nor there. Sears school was a lot different in the late '80s than it, you know, than I've than, heard. It, than it is, you know. I think. And uh, yeah, like yeah, again, uh, somehow I was able to make it through that. Like I don't even to this day I don't even know. So I, so that was kind of one of the you know few difficult. Like I hadn't spent a lot of time in the field. Like I wasn't, you know, I didn't. I I taught myself how to use a, 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 a compass and a map and I trained on my own and I kind of got myself in shape. So going through the, wow. the Q course to me, everything was new. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when I say everything, I mean everything. It was just like this fire hose from everything. Mm -hmm. And I was incredibly blessed and fortunate. Um, I was a young guy. And uh, I'll never forget. Uh, I still remember their. I still remember their names. Ranger Brady, who I think he turned out to be a a real a pipe hitter over in uh, in fifth group for a long time. And uh, Ranger Jewel, hmm. these two Ranger qualified NCOs. For the life of me, I don't know why they kind of took me under their wing. And. Um, 
<laughs> Showed yeah. me. I remember, and I'll just tell you this funny story. One time, we we were out in phase one doing patrolling, you know, and like all of this stuff is new to me. And we we set up in a patrol base, and and I'm over there changing my socks. Okay, I'm just I'm taking my boots off, changing my socks. And Brady crawled over there, and he, I mean, he looked at me like he wanted to rip my throat out, and he said, "Hey, don't ever." ever take both your boots off at the oh, same yeah. time okay well think about that i mean that that's how important is it is it to know something like that okay no. that's really important to know but until someone explains that type of detail and until you, you know what i mean like that's yeah. just not something that you inherently know and so Throughout my entire time in the Q course, I had guys that that did that for me. Um, Police and Kyle you know. Lamb, who who was a is a legend over there in 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 you know Delta and all that. He uh, I went through phase two with him, mm. and he you know we went through all the Morse code and all of that stuff together. And he was just a very helpful person to me. And so we get out to Robin Sage. And all of that stuff is new to me as well. And so we we infilled into Robin Sage. And, of course, we did, the, you know, linking up with the G's and walking through the woods with, oh, you know, the huge rucksacks. I mean, I think that they've probably cut down the amount of weight that you can carry, whatever it is. But, I mean, I, I, I'll, oh, my God, just, just <laughs> horrible. You know, you're going back and forth over the river two or three different times. You know the deal. You know, yeah. you know. And uh, we finally get to the base camp. We've been down there literally. We've been down there five minutes, five minutes. And the team leader came down and said, hey, Gant, they want to talk to the youngest member of the team. So oh take your weapon <laughs> and your ruck and walk up the hill and go up there. Well, Keep in mind, I know two things about what's going on. That's jack and shit. You know, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't really know. And so I get up there, and there's said G chief in this throne of a built up on this big pile of you know wood and stuff. He's sitting up on the throne, and he's got his twenty five G's around him. And I walk up, and they all point their weapons at me. Oh boy. And said, lay down your weapon, take off your rucksack. So I laid down my weapon <laughs> and took off my rucksack. And about two minutes later, they had all my comms gear. And uh, do you remember the old one time pads? They had yeah. all my one time pads, oh they had all my secret stuff. And uh, then they said, uh, take your clothes off. Oh, God. <laughs> so. I took my clothes off <laughs> <laughs> and then they took me over to a tree, set me down and, you know, put my hands around the tree and uh, tie tied my hands around the tree and put a blindfold on me. Oh boy. So literally, literally <laughs> 20 minutes into Robin Sage, you know, linking up with the G chief, I'm naked tied, tied to a oh, tree. Gosh. And of course, you know, Two hours later, after they've had, you know, given up half their half their op fund, you know, they they buy me back. And needless to say, uh, my team wasn't wasn't very happy with me. But that that's a uh, that's how my Robin Sage experience uh, started off the first time. Wow, that's yeah, that's a, what a way to get started. <laughs> it all has to go up uh, from there. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know yeah. what it and sounds. It did. Yeah, it did. what it what it sounds like, Jim, is uh, you know a lot of guys that go to the queue today, these days, um, I think it's it's the same for them. Also, they a lot of them don't have a lot of training, and they uh, you know they hopefully they're fortunate to bump into somebody like some of those guys you mentioned. And yeah, and, uh, yeah, and I, I found <clears throat> it's like that. You know, uh, they when they can, it's really good. And so, yeah, the, um, so you made it through, you made it through the queue. Uh, you, you got to get your clothes back at some point. I did. 
I mean, you're going to have to, you're going to need those. But yeah, that, uh, God, what a nightmare that must have been. Uh, and then having to, to work out of those problems. But yeah, the, uh, I mean, Robin Sage is, uh, is quite an animal. And uh, yeah, that, that can't happen. I've, but I've never heard that before. But uh, that is quite an experience. Uh, and yeah. so, another, so, yeah. another thing that I actually, that, that stayed with me, if you, if, if, you know, followed the kind of the course of, of how I learned things. One of the things that stayed with me was um, the other 18 echo that I was going through was, was struggling quite a bit with, with just leading patrols and different things like that. So they, they were putting a lot of pressure on him to do other things. And it, it kind of came down. I was making the comm shots, both the comm shots every day uh, for, for most of Robin Sage. But then at very end, uh, like it was kind of my go, no go mission. I, I had to do a reconnaissance of our uh, extraction landing zone. Mm. And in the time frame that they had given me to do it, it was impossible that like, there was just no way there, there was no way. I remember what it was. They had given it to me in the morning and I had to be back by midnight with the, the information and, uh, the and it, I could be slightly wrong in the in the in the how far it was, but I remember it just sitting here today as being about 18 kilometers. Well, there's no wow. way you can move like that. You just can't do that. You, you can't do that on foot. And uh, I remember the NCO that was with me uh, that I chose to go with me. We took off through the woods and there was just no way we we're going to make it. And so we pulled up. And there was this house kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And I said, hey, man, leave your stuff here. Go and knock on that door. And literally, let's see if this guy will give us a ride. And his name was Steve. Steve went down there, knocked on the door. And I'm watching him from the wood line, you know. Wow. And next thing I know, he goes in the house. <laughs> and he's in there like an hour and he comes back out and he walks over to where I'm at and they had fed him lunch. Oh boy. He had eaten this big <laughs> lunch. And he, if, I, if I remember correctly, they gave him some blueberry pie and he said, uh, Hey, the dude's happy to give us a ride. We just have to put our weapons in the back of the truck. So we did that and he drove us straight to the LZ. We surveyed the LZ got back in the truck and he drove us all the way to like within a click or two of the G base. And now wow. it's, you know, it's like five o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> and so Steve and I said, Hey, we need to make this look as best as we can. So we set up a little hide site and we slept for four or five hours until, you know, 10 or 11 at night, whatever time it was. Then we walked back in and we had this information and, uh, 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 the NCO in charge, I'll remember his name, Sergeant Snow, he called me over. He's like, Gant, how did you get this information? And I was like, hey, Sergeant, you know, we, we just, we got it done. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's happen. one of my favorite, favorite stories. And I, I learned wow. a lot from that. Oh, you got to accomplish the mission. You got to do it. And, and mm. sometimes you can't do it in a conventional way, you know? Yeah, <clears throat> that's fantastic. I mean, uh and it reminds me, you know, you went through in like 88, you said something like that's 87, yeah, 88. That's, that's, okay. That's, I went through selection. I started the Q course in 89 and, and got out like late 89 or early 90, right before mm. desert storms. Something okay. like that. Yeah. Awesome. And so, so then, uh, so you go off to, you went to, uh, which group did you begin with? I, I, I went to fifth group okay. and, um, I went to second battalion, fifth group, a lot of really incredible, incredible guys there. And, um, uh, we, we deployed over there and I was an 18 echo and I actually, I, I was not on the ODA. I got to go in with a, with the battalion commander and a detachment of dudes. And I don't know doctrinally, whatever, but they called it the jump battle staff. And mm. we were with, uh, uh, the Egyptian, uh, like the, you know, the, the leader of the Egyptian forces over mm. there. And so 
um, you know, we I got to go in and, and kind of see how that worked at a at a at a higher at a higher level. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you just you got there just in time, and then you're like, hey, Justin, put put your stuff on the <laughs> plane. So I was curious about this. Once you got to group, uh, and these, you know, I would say, you know, at least for me, getting to group, brand, being brand new, I was, uh, you know, those are formative years. Uh, was there anybody that stood out in your mind that uh, impressed you that, that um, you know, you, you looked at and you was like, hey, that's a guy I want to emulate? Was there, was there anybody like that that stuck out? Well, you know, I was, like I said, I was, I was, I was pretty young and, uh, um, I, I didn't go straight. Like I said, I, I, I didn't go straight to an, to an ODA. I, um, teams were starting to deploy. Um, I, I hooked up with, uh, a, a great NCO, uh, last name was Hendrix and, uh, he was on the scuba team. And like we did PT together every morning and there was a period of time when I was like super psyched that maybe I could get on his team. Mm. And uh, then we, we, we deployed over there. And then when we got back for a very short, short period of time, ODA 553 had a team sergeant uh, who had had been in in Vietnam, Master Sergeant Balog. And um, he was just like, he, he was just very well respected, super squared away. I had a little bit of interaction with him. Uh, then they, they, the, the team was kind of in flux, and I didn't, I didn't spend, Paul, I didn't spend much time on that team, and didn't only, and didn't, didn't train with them very often. Um, and so, to be perfectly honest with you, I, I did not my, my time in fifth group um, because of, of when I got there how we deployed, how we came back. And then I, I had made the decision to, to, uh, it's, it, that's just a whole other story, but right. really, really what, what my time in desert storm and that, that limited amount of time that, uh, I spent there, what I got out of that was, uh, um, I think I need to become an officer mm. and I don't mean that in a, in a, in a, in a real positive sense. Um, uh, the officers that I dealt with in the jump battle staff had one that was off the charts. Incredible captain, uh, was just, I mean, this dude was just great. And the other one was, uh, uh, I, I, I don't, I, I can't, say exactly what he was but he was pretty damn worthless Mm. and um you know i was watching that thing and i i had been a leader in in you know growing up and and uh i thought to myself well if i'm going to stick around in the military uh i i want to i want to become an officer and i didn't join because i wanted to be an officer and i almost re-enlisted for six years and the only reason i didn't stay in nco was that uh, I told the battalion sergeant major I wanted to re-enlist for six years and get the eighteen thousand dollar bonus, and I wanted to go to scuba school. Mm. And he said, "Hey, Gant, I'm not promising you anything. Eighteen thousand dollar bonus, take it or leave it." I mean, he was oh. like, you know, <laughs> and so I left it. I left it on the table. Wow. So, you know, yeah. that's what's interesting is uh, uh, maybe I don't know if you ever thought about this, but being on that staff for that deployment to desert storm, it seemed like that was formative in your mind, uh, at least to, to see kind of what officers did and, and evaluate, you know, at least the one that you thought was uh, not worth the salt that perhaps you could do a better job. And, and, and maybe that solidified um, in your mind that, you know, at least being exposed to that, that's something at least you could, you could possibly do. Is that, would that be uh, oh, yeah. somewhat accurate? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then and, and the jump battle staff, I don't know, there was probably about, there was probably about six, six, six of us. There was, there, you know, there was the battalion commander, the battalion star major. Then there was 
uh, these two captains that were kind of like, you know, battle captains. And mm -hmm. then there was two, two 18 echoes, me and this other 18 echo that had to run all this comm gear. And then there was two more, uh, uh, signals NCOs that, that kind of, uh, helped, you know, setting up the radio systems and all of that. But it was, it was good for me and to seeing, I, I don't know, man, we had, I don't know, a dozen different types of radios and, and it was a constant, just a constant, you know, coordination. And, uh, we, we actually, you know, we could call in some casts and some different things like mm -hmm. that, but, um, you know, uh, and people forget about desert storm. We kicked the hell out of them. You know, oh, it yeah. was, it was not even a, it was not even a, uh, much of a fight, but we did not know that when we crossed the berm, like absolutely not. We did it. Yeah. Super, we didn't know it was going to turn out the, yeah. the way that it did. So, you know, there were, there were parts of that, 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 uh, at the time were, were pretty damn scary, you know, and as yeah. it turned out, it you know, turned out to not be, not be much, but we didn't know that going over the berm, you know, that's true. Hey, so what was it, what was it like? Uh, this is something I never did. So I did 20 years and I retired as a master sergeant, but what was it like, uh, going from NCO to officer? I mean, how did that go? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. I I I tell people this. I uh uh I spent uh about six and a half years with with uh when when I when I got out of fifth group to go back to college, I actually went to the twelfth special forces group, mm -hmm. which was there in El Paso. You know, they they a long time ago they got they got rid of the eleventh and the twelfth right. special forces group who were reserve uh, groups. And I, I spent about uh, two years over there. Um, so, you know, I had, a, I had a close to seven years uh, just running around in different capacities, doing different things with, uh, with SF dudes. And I knew that when I, my goal when I became an officer was obviously to get back to group. However, uh, my four years in the infantry, I spent two years as a rifle platoon leader and two years as a scout scout platoon leader, and th those were those were incredibly formative years. Those were the those were the years where I was really, really, really able to to hone two things: one, uh, my leadership skills. Mm. Uh, when I got to the infantry, I was just shocked at how badly they needed good leadership. They just needed good, good leadership. And the other thing that it did for me was I, I became just a subject matter expert in, uh, hey man, raid, recon, ambush, the battle oh. drills. Like I just really delved into that. And I know that you did that for a long time. And that's important, man. Like, mm. you're, you're, do you really know how to set up ambush? Like, a, I'm, I'm not talking about a bullshit ambush. I'm yeah. talking about the real deal, a raid, mm -hmm. a reconnaissance. Um, a lot of stuff. Can you do the yeah. battle? What makes sense? And, you know, the old 7 8, um, that's just a guide. And so, uh, what I did when I was in the infantry was just really, really, delved deeply into those and wrote my own SOPs for, for my platoon. And in a lot of cases, we'd go to FTXs and different things like that. It was always frustrating to me to like get graded on those because you'd have infantry captains, infantry majors, SAR major stuff like that. Like, Hey, what the hell are y'all doing Gant? And I'm like, hmm. Hey, we're doing what we would do in combat. Yeah. Not, not what the book tells you to do. And there, like, I remember like how they taught leaders recons. It was like, what, that doesn't make any sense to do it. Like, I mean, there was just a bunch of different things like that. And so I was able to hone my leadership skills, see firsthand how important good leadership was and, and then become, you know, become a, a an expert at, at tactics, both at the infantry level and for the, the, the scout platoon and the, the scout platoon, when I was in the scout platoon, mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, that was some of the best, uh, men I ever worked alongside ever mm -hmm. in my entire career. And, um, so it was really, really fulfilling. And that's kind of what got me set up when I went back to the Q course. Um, 
it was uh, it was it was different for me. But I, I think that that what really helped me was that was that time the time that I spent in the infantry. The the big thing that happened for me was is I had sustained a a an injury uh, when I was going through. I didn't go to the infantry advanced course. I went to the military intelligence advanced course. And actually. Mm went through the counterintelligence course there and, and got qualified as a CI agent while I was there, but that's another story. Mm. Um, but I sustained, I sustained a, a, I pulled a groin muscle when I was training uh, to go back to the Q course and turned out to be one of the worst injuries I ever had. When I showed up, there was way too many guys uh, scheduled to go out to phase one. And uh, one of the, uh, uh, officers that was in charge of SWIC, there's like this formation of, I don't know, a couple hundred guys. They walked out there and said, hey, is there anybody in this formation that doesn't feel like they need to go to phase one? Dude, I ran through that formation like nobody's business. <laughs> I mean, I said, I don't feel like I need to go. And so we had to write up a little memo. And so I didn't have to go to phase one mm. again. I didn't have to, to, to do the SUT stuff again. Went through phase two, and it was it was very informative. Had good instructors, learned a whole lot. Then we went out to Robin Sage. What happened was, is that um, for your second, they tour. made me. <laughs> yeah. What's that for your second tour in Pineland? <laughs> yeah, for my second tour, I was hoping I didn't end up naked tied to a tree. Yeah. Uh, the cadre, the cadre put me in charge of of the planning phase. Hmm. And uh, so I did all the planning, and then on infill, uh, the cadre snatched me off the team and uh, 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 basically they, they pulled me out, put me in this little place to do reconnaissance, and uh, I, I pretty much stayed. They, they kept me away from the team pretty much the entire time oh boy. so that uh, – <laughs> The other captain and those guys could could, yeah. could go through that. <clears throat> they were, um, I would I, imagine, those guys were drafting on you, and they're like, "Yeah, you know, Gants are ace in the hole," and uh, they wanted to see if that if those other uh, those other captains would fold. I mean, I understand that makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah, that's how it turned out. And you know what? Um, the other captain, God bless him, guy named Mark. Uh, Mike Tarvlosky, he, uh, uh, we were lieutenants together in Hawaii and, uh, he went to fifth group and, uh, was killed in Iraq mm. and, uh, was awarded a silver star. Mm. So, um, he was, he was, he was a good man, a good friend and one hell of a warrior. So, uh, the last thing I told him though was, Hey dude, when the resupply comes in, get it out of the camp, like get it out of the camp just as fast as you can. And, uh, he didn't. And they oh. got hit, and I was like, "Damn it, Mike!" <laughs> uh, it had it was that, time. The G base, uh, the dreaded G base blowout, uh, fully laden with uh, supplies. Mm. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and Fun. just one thing on that. You know, uh, when when I worked out there, I loved working out at, at Robin Sage, and uh, we, uh, the, me and the NCOs that, that worked out there, we didn't make that a a for sure thing. Um, right. We we made that totally based on on the security and how the team was doing uh, in regards to uh, setting up that outer security and all those different things. And so about half the time we blew them out. But but if yeah. they were doing the right <laughs> things, we, we we didn't we didn't put them through that just for the hell of it. You yeah, know? that's fair. That's that's a that's a good approach to training. I hope. That uh, most of the teams are doing that. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. awesome. But it's a damn good exercise, isn't it, to get blown out of there in the middle of the night? It is. That is <laughs> a you know being being on the other side. It is uh, it is interesting to watch. Uh, quite sure. a, a, a um, you know problem set to work through. Uh, but that's interesting. Yeah, you were able to go back through. Of course, you know by virtue of going to the Alpha course. Having previously been an NCO, he got to go through twice. And then what did you see as far as um, um, what you had? Maybe I wanted to ask you this earlier, but I wanted to ask you what uh, the motto of SF means to you. Uh, 
um, and and what it started to mean at some point it it started to mean more to you like Deo Presser Liber. Um, yeah, I mean that's a really important motto that we have, and I just wanted to tease out like, you know what, what what does that mean to you? I think I, I mean I could answer that for you, but I just want to hear in your own words, you know what that means and how that like grew to mean more uh, as you were yeah. progressing in the regiment. Yeah, that's that's actually a, a, a great a great question. You know, I think a lot of uh, you know, a lot of that, it kind of, it kind of comes with maturity. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, you, and I'm just saying one, a person, and I can only really speak for myself, you know, you join, you join special forces, you want to become a Green Beret for, it, there's all kinds of different reasons, as you know, every, every, every person has, has their own has their own reason for wanting to do it. Sometimes, sometimes those reasons can be incredibly selfish. Sometimes those reasons are, Hey, I just want to be, work alongside the best. Hey, I want to push myself. Can I do this? And, you know, being in the military, uh, being in the army, um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of, of status, um, that comes with, with being a green beret. And and uh, being a special forces soldier, I mean, and I I personally, man, th- there was nothing like there was nothing like there was nothing like putting on that uniform mm. with that special forces tab and then putting on that green beret and going to work. Like, you know, when when you have that and you're you're just walking around the base, you're you're off in some place doing some training. You don't have to say anything about yourself. You and your guys don't have to say anything because there's there's an incredible amount of respect and admiration that that comes from that. Mm. Once you get in, um, and it depends. It depends on many things. Like I was incredibly fortunate. Right when I got out of the Q course the first time, there's a war. I was in. I was in the Q course when eleven happened. Wow. So yeah. I remember exactly where I was. And so, look, man, you're going to war like like that changes the 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 outlook. And all of the, the special forces missions are incredibly important. I would say our peacetime mission is is in many aspects more important than our than our wartime mission, of course, depending on 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 what the what the war is. But. We can keep wars from happening if we if we do our job really well and are in the right place. Absolutely. So I say, I'll say that you know I, I get to Afghanistan, very little information, brand new team, set up the sixth ODA in Alpha Company, first battalion. You know they shut down all the sixth teams, and then the war started. They stood them back up. So right. I'm a new guy. All the guys are new guys. We get over there and the mission is kill, capture HVTs. Like that's the mission. Mm. And so I, I kind of, I, that's when I bumped into, to, uh, Malik Norafzal or sitting bull down in Manguel. And we started, I started seeing these, these other things, but then even my second rotation up, up in Hellman and Goresh, uh, that you're very familiar with, it was the same mission, mm. kill or capture. And so, then, you know, I, I, I come back, spent two years on a special projects team. Then when I go to Iraq, it's leading a QRF commando, commando battalion, killer capture. Mm-hmm. And so it was it it was it was very specific in that um, I overall knew about the the, you know, counterinsurgency, what it was we were trying to do. But there wasn't really a connection with the local people, the local population, you know, getting deep into um, uh, uh, this 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 overall umbrella of freeing the oppressed. Right. And it wasn't until my my two years out at Robin Sage where I really was had to and wanted to 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 jump deep into the doctrine and then going back to Afghanistan for those 
last uh, 22 months where De Oppresso Liber, freeing the oppressed, um, became uh, in the forefront of my mind. In other words, you know, the overall mission to go into these these countries and and help them throw off the yoke of of whatever the situation is uh, that 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 they may be under, it became it became so real to me yeah. because because I I I fell in love with these people. They fell in love with me. They they were my family. And it was it was a, a large tribe, and and we expanded. We had a lot of success, but I became very very personally invested in these people, and I wanted very very much for them to not have to live under the the iron fist of of the Taliban. So to free the oppressed became more than just a, a motto. It, 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 it ran through my blood and the blood of my men for, for a long, long time. And so, um, you know, your, your mottos and your mantras matter. Yeah. And I think that, that, um, if anything, we should, we should, uh, emphasize that even more in our training and even more as, as a part of, of what we do when we are trying to recruit, uh, special forces soldiers and other things. I think we should emphasize that even more than we do. Yeah, well said. No, I couldn't agree more. Uh, it's it's more than just a fantastic motto. It, it is a mission. Yes. It's a mission set. And and uh, yes. you know, like you, I know that uh, I was over there. You know, oh three. Uh, my last deployment was in uh, two thousand nine. I went over there again in uh, ten. Uh, to Iraq as a contractor, but uh, it seemed like early on we were just caught up in coin and CT and, um, you know, notwithstanding the initial uh, involvement of uh, SF in Afghanistan. Other than that, once Iraq happened and and Afghanistan in in large measure became a backwater and a sideshow, it seemed like we just kind of forgot, group kind of forgot, you know, what we were doing. Uh, our main mission and until later. Um, I mean, that's just my take because we, we would just do killer capture missions and then, uh, and that is uh, certainly can be part of UW, but we didn't, I guess what I'm trying to say is it seemed like we've kind of forgot that, that mission of the oppressor layer brooks kind of, kind of put on the back burner in some sense. Uh, at least that was my experience. Well, I, I couldn't. I could not agree with you more. And in in you know, I will be the first person to say that I was was a big a bigger problem with that than any SF guy that's ever walked. I um, I did not. Um, you know, when I when I when I first deployed, when I was a team leader, like it was it was it was about pipe hit like Mm -hmm. that's that's where it was at that's what it was about with that being said i do want to i do want to say this um no man of any time any war any place was more blessed uh with the uh with the warriors that he had around him and i i had Mm. i had man i had the most incredible oda that, that I can imagine having. And one of the things that I was just, even to this day that I'm, 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 I'm just incredibly proud of was literally in one 24 hour period there in the Konar, uh, we could do all, all of the, the, the major SF missions in one day. I mean, in one day we could literally do just about everything that needed to be done. We could do a, we would do a raid. We could go out and, and sometimes we would break up into split teams and be able to do, uh, you know, a, a low vis recon. And then we'd get a call and go out and disarm an ID. Then we'd, we'd hold a Jurga. And then, I mean, and, you know, and all the time running this, this real small, uh, uh, UW hospital where people were coming in. I mean, 
I, I just had I just had an incredible, incredible ODA, and uh, and you know to say we could do it all was is is a good way to put it because we actually really could do that, and the the thing that allowed us to be able to do that was our training. We just mm. trained. We just trained and trained and trained and trained and trained. That was pretty much if we weren't out on a combat op, we were, we were training. Which, you know, once once you get into uh, get to a certain level of proficiency, you don't need a lot of time to roll out the front gate and do whatever you need to do. You can just do yeah. it. And yeah. uh, that that's what I had. That's what I had on my team. Yeah, I mean that that certainly describes the plug and play nature of SF that wins wars. Uh, to be able to roll yes. around and do all those. Um, uh, t- you know, this tactical task and all those things. So uh, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to talk about this uh, incident you had at 06. Uh, you were leading a team in Iraq in 06, in November timeframe, and your vehicle, the vehicle you're in was hit by an IED. And I've seen a picture of what that IED did to your vehicle. And I'm going to assume that that was quite a dark hour for you. And I just need to ask you, how did you, how did you recover from that? Shifting gears here. Yeah. 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 You know, uh, tactically a a whole lot, a whole lot, just to put it into a little bit of context. um, We, we, it was up, it was up. It was actually the city of Balad, which was near the Fa Balad up there. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, Colonel Lewis, who was one of the greatest combat commanders that I, I had. And I, um, um, just another part of this, this story, um, he, he later, he later, uh, committed suicide and it was one of the, it was one of the most difficult things that I ever, ever had to, to deal mm-hmm. with because I, not only was he com- my commanding officer, but he was a, a dear, dear friend of mine, and and that that's a that's a whole other story that maybe we can talk about sometime. But mm. uh, he called me up and he said, "Hey Jim, uh, we got some big time sectarian violence going on down the city of Balad. They are at each other's throats. Um, here's the mission statement: get up there and fix it." <laughs> <laughs> That was that was the mission statement. Figure so, it out. My <laughs> uh, small detachment we grabbed two hundred commandos. We rolled up there, had to fight our way in, and uh, you know we're setting up and our taking mortar fire all night. I mean, it was it was the the, the heaviest six weeks of fighting I've I've ever done. And at two, every two week interval. Uh, uh, they had to switch out their 200 commandos. So every once every two weeks, the commandos that were in Balad needed to get back to Baghdad, and the the commandos that were in Baghdad needed to get back to Balad. Well, as you recall, the the road from Balad to Baghdad was just a nightmare. Like mm. it was just an absolute nightmare. And you want to get back to freeing the oppressed uh, and and this by with through i could not um you know i could not live with myself to let these commandos drive this you know this 80 kilometers 90 kilometers whatever it was i don't remember exactly in their soft skin vehicles without our firepower and mm-hmm. so once every two weeks i'd grab these 200 commandos and uh i i would lead them back to baghdad pick up the other ones and then you know head back to Balad. that's that's just something that we did and this particular night because uh, we would always do it at night um i always because of the the up armored vehicle and i spent three or four hours every single day seven days a week looking at the IED reports, looking at all the, the photos, figuring out what type of IED where, like, that was my business. As you know, uh, IEDs were the, were, were the issue, man. We weren't going to lose direct fire engagements in Afghanistan or Iraq. We generally put an ass whooping on them when that happened. Mm. But those IEDs just really leveled the field. And so 
that was always the primary enemy, the one that I was that I was after. Hence, I always was in the lead vehicle, always, 100% of the time. And this particular night, um, we were up front, and I I wanted to very quickly get back to the rear of the convoy and kind of clear the side because there had been a bunch of IEDs hitting the 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 convoys on the east side of the road. So so I, I was I was trying to keep that from happening. And we were at the back of the convoy, and I told my driver, "Hey, gun it. We need mm-hmm. to get up back to the front." So. You know, we're in these big ass up armors with all the armor on it. And uh, as we directly, as we pulled back into the front of the convoy going, you know, 50 miles an hour, that thing was, you know, pegged out. We all saw it like Mm. we all saw it. And uh, it was a one five five round. I mean, it was just in the middle of the road. There was but there was nothing we can do. Uh, We hit that thing head on. And uh, immediately blew the vehicle uh, off the road, and there was a, an embankment on the road. It rolled, God knows how many times. Uh, hmm. Thank God that the up armor landed on its upright, so the 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 uh, the up armor landed upright. And um, do you remember the Halon systems and all that business right. that they they? Yeah. They had them there. Well, uh, it, you know, it's pretty much pure chaos. Uh, the, ve- the vehicle, the rear of the vehicle was on fire. And um, I reached over. I was smashed up into the windshield. All the radios and everything had me pinned mm. inside the vehicle up against the, uh, the window. And I reached down and and was just going to pull the door open and and kind of fall out, and the the door was jammed. The door would not open. Dang. And uh, um. And it's on fire. I, I thought, and it's on <sighs> fire. And now yes. the halon system has gone off. Which anybody that knows about it takes all the oxygen out of the vehicle, so it's on fire, can't breathe, and I I can't get out. And uh, I unlatched my my weapon and tried to stand up, and I I, I couldn't I couldn't couldn't get out. And um, I had the specific thought: this is how it ends. I'm wow. going to die here. There's nothing that I can do about it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I went unconscious. Mm-hmm. When I came to the first time, I was on the side of the road next to one of the other up armors Uh, my 2ic was was calling a medevac and um here's what i want to say about that when i first got these commandos when we first got these commandos they were a militia and um they weren't they weren't sure what to, to to think of the us Americans and I, I spent all of my time, all of my days, down there at Site One with the commander, was Colonel Doffer, and his commandos, and we trained together, and we did raids together, and um, they 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 saw me out there, and I I. Uh, at that time, I didn't let the other guys in the vehicles uh, and the rest of the team get out of their vehicles. I was the only one that would get out of the vehicles and actually conduct the raid with the commandos. I didn't feel like it was those guys' businesses to be doing the raids with the commandos, but I did. Mm. And when we got up to Balad, the fighting was incredibly heavy, and there were many times when we first got up there when the fighting would start they wouldn't go into the battle. It would just be me and my guys. Mm-hmm. After a couple of weeks of them seeing that we were willing to fight, they started jumping in as well. And um, so flash back to this situation. We've been fighting for, for several weeks up there. Uh, what happened was in the back of my vehicle, the Commando 2IC was there. 
and he crawled through the turret, got some air, and went back down into that burning up armor and wow. somehow pulled me out. Think about this. All my body armor, all my shit on, pulled me up, pushed me to that turret, and a couple of commandos jumped on the, the top of it and, and pulled me out. Wow. Um, drug me to the side of the road. And I said all that to say that all those hours and days and weeks with them every day, mm -hmm. training with them, drinking tea with them, taking care of their wounded, playing cards with them, watching TV with them, just being with them, that's what saved my life. Wow. Because yeah. they loved me. They cared about me. They knew that I would risk my life for them because I did it over and over and over. Mm. And they were not going to let me die in there. Mm. And, uh, um, yeah, they, my Iraqis uh, saved my life that, wow. that night. And, you yeah. know, got on that medevac. Next thing I know, I was, I was there in Balad. And, yeah, that's, that's what happened. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that, uh, that certainly underscores the importance of building rapport. Yeah being, uh, you know, which is a basic SF guy skill, but not only that, but yep. well beyond rapport is, is, uh, your, your willingness to sacrifice yourself to defend yes. those who can't defend themselves. I mean, yes. that, that, that's yes. the essence of the oppressive labor is, is, uh, that's it. you know, that's it's, it. you know, fighting, fighting evil and, uh, wanting to see people, you know, uh, you know, uh, brought out from the clutches of, uh, you know, yes. tyrants. That's, yes. that's fantastic. And, you know, yeah, and, and yeah, I want to well, just, just going to say, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. You know, I, I, no, I studied this for, for many, 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 many years and, uh, uh, you know, building rapport, uh, is one thing. Building a relationship yeah. is, is something different. And my goal was with, with our, with the forces that I that I worked with in in Iraq and then again in in that last rotation in Afghanistan was was building a relationship, mm. rapport and relationship is not the same thing, and uh, um, and so you know there there there's a deeper there's a deeper level there that once you as an as a special forces operator that once you get to that once you get to that relationship level. Mm. Um, there's nothing that you won't do for them and there's nothing that they won't do for you. And that is when the magic happens. That's when you can have some, some real impact on the, on the overall mission right there. Wow. I mean, that's, uh, that's a lot to take in. That's fantastic. And I, you know, that was one hell of a scrape, uh, and, and one hell of a, a brush with death. And, uh, I just wanted to ask you also, uh, maybe end on this is, uh, you know, and I know you to be a man of faith, uh, a man who fears God, hates evil. But I mean, what did that do? If you could just t uh, tell us a little bit about that, what what did that do to your faith? Uh, ha having brushed death, and and uh, and and thinking you were going to die, and then you know all of that. What did that do to your faith? <sighs> Small well, question. Yeah. That's a that's a, <laughs> that's a really that's a that's a really complex question. I I uh, um I was I was saved and baptized with my mother. We were baptized at the same time in the same pool when I was thirteen years old, and and I uh, I started reading the Bible pretty much daily when I was very young teenager and read it front to cover six or seven times by the time that, that I joined the military. And I was, I was a young man, had a young family and was doing the, the best, best that I could with, with my faith. It wasn't that I didn't believe, but, but I, I, I my faith was clear, but not strong. Is, is what I would say and not not in in any you know 
way. And, and I tried to manifest that in, in the best way that I knew how as, as a young, very young man. Um, and then, Paul, when the, when the, when the war started, I, uh, I had an incredibly, incredibly difficult time um, with what I was doing to other human beings and what I was asking my men to do and, and how I asked them to do it. Um, I didn't, uh, I didn't even feel like I was in a position or worthy to pray. I didn't, I didn't even pray during these years at war. And I didn't, I didn't pray because I, I just felt like there was just too much, there was just too much blood on my hands and my eyes. Mm. And, um, the only thing I did before every single mission is I would quickly walk to the, 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 the front of my vehicle or, or before we stepped out and I would just, I would just say, protect my men and help me die with bravery and courage with strength. Mm. That's it. And I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't reconcile really what I was doing with, with the faith that I had. Um, my faith, uh, Jesus mounted the most incredible, he, he, he mounted the most incredible rescue operation to save me. And, and all of this came after the wars, um, when I was just in the abyss, I, 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 I wasn't standing next to the abyss. I had become the abyss and, and it was the killing and it was, uh, this incredible dependence on, on alcohol and drugs and, and getting back to this incident we just talked about, mm. Paul, there was, there was, and my wife, can attest to this there was several years where five or six times a week every single night i was i was awakened screaming and yelling because i was burning to death in that vehicle like it became it became it became so much a part of my life that i was constantly in that vehicle just just constantly and um, after after many many years, and I won't get into the details here of, of searching and asking and knocking, um, uh, Jesus Jesus saved me mm -hmm. and put uh, everything that I had been through and all of the killing, and um, you know combat breaks down a lot of moral walls or it did for me there were a lot of a lot of moral walls that were broken down in combat and unfortunately i brought all of that stuff home with me and um uh and then the the actual you know as a as a as a, as a more mature human and having experienced everything that I experienced, it wasn't really until then that I was able to, to put everything that had happened with me and my men and the wars and all that into any type of context. And I have to have to say here, just as plain as I can, that I just could not deal with everything that happened. Uh, Jesus dealt with it mm -hmm. for me. Praise and God. that is what saved me. That is what saved me. I was trying to do it on my own and just could not. Mm. And uh, come to me, come to me, all of you who are tired, mm. all of you who cannot, you know, um, the burdens that you are carrying are, 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 are too heavy. Come to me and I will help you. And, mm. and I unequivocally can say that um, my relationship with Jesus is, is the most important thing in my life. The greatest honor that I've ever had in all of my life it has nothing to do with being a Green Beret. It's it's 
it's the calling that that he gave me to to become his disciple mm. and um it's only now that i can put all of these these things uh in in into context and so i can only be thankful for the experiences that i had i can't i can't feel anything but but being thankful um mm. and uh every day every day i i thank god that i'm alive and that he's given me this opportunity to to redeem the time that I've been given, mm. and to uh, point at the at at the exit sign, the door, and that's him. And mm. and for me, it was the only way out. I'd be dead. I'd be a dead man. I'd be homeless. I'd be in prison. And I'm talking about after the wars. Had it mm. not been uh, for Jesus reaching out his hand and, and saying, come to me, do not be afraid. Mm. Praise God. I, I, yeah, I, there's not much I could say after that. that that's, uh, that is both moving, uh, that is, uh, revelatory. Uh, yeah. And for our friends, if, uh, you're suffering, uh, take solace in that, uh, as, uh, as Jim has found, uh, the Lord does say, cast all your cares uh, upon him, says the Apostle Peter, and all your worries and all your concerns, because uh, he does care. Amen. I mean, that is powerful. And you're right. Uh, what a great honor it is. Uh, what a great honor it has been for you to be on the podcast, sir. Uh, I thank you for your loyal and patriotic service to our country. I thank you for your willingness to sacrifice yourself for our nation, uh, for your, uh, your, your men, uh, for those who couldn't defend themselves, uh, all those scrapes, uh, all those fights that you're in, and you did that for us. I appreciate that. And, and especially I appreciate your testimony to the saving power of Jesus Christ. Uh, that is mankind's only Savior. And so we would be remiss if we did not give him credit and you certainly do uh, the Lord honor. So I thank you for that. Um, and uh, for those who don't know, um, Major Gant, uh, he has, he's the author of One Tribe at a Time, uh, which uh, was, has an introduction by Stephen Pressfield. Uh, and if you didn't know about uh, One Tribe at a Time is uh, the paper that changed the war in Afghanistan. I believe uh, uh, Major Gant had a strategy, if uh, would have been followed, uh, it could have achieved success in Afghanistan. Uh, that's how big of a deal it was. Uh, also, uh, written by Ann Scott Tyson is the, the book American Spartan, which is a fantastic read. And I would recommend both of those uh, books to you. And uh, But, sir, uh, what a wonderful time we've had together. Um, I just wanted to end by reading this. It's the... Um, uh, the, fi- the fifth stanza of the Special Forces Creed. And I think this is something that you have demonstrated to us through your life. Let me just read this. Here's the fifth stanza of the Special Forces Creed. I know that I will be called upon to perform tasks in isolation, far from familiar faces and voices. With the help and guidance of my God, I will conquer my fears and succeed. And uh, so, Jim... You certainly are a testament to that. And uh, I thank you for coming on the podcast, and thank you for being uh, a model uh, believer. Thank you, sir. And uh, if we could uh, ask you to uh, pray for us as we close. Yes. And, uh, Paul, I just want to tell you it's it's been an incredible honor to – to speak with you today, and um, I, I have, I have a lot of respect and admiration for you, and, and a lot of love for you, and 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 um, for all the SF dudes way before us, and uh, the ones that are doing it now, and the ones that uh, will be doing it in the future. And I, I loved being a Green Beret very much, and it was a very, very uh, wonderful and informative time in my life, and. Bottom line is I would I would do it all again. I might do it a little differently. Eh, maybe not too much differently, <laughs> but uh, it's been a great honor uh, yeah. for me to, to talk with you today. Thank you so much. Yes, sir.
Dear Heavenly Father, all praise goes to you. All thanksgiving goes to you. Forgive us where we fail thee. Forgive us when we fail ourselves. We pray for all those everywhere who are under stress and duress, the ones that are involved in these wars, the ones that are fighting them, the innocents that are being touched by them. And dear Heavenly Father, Dear Jesus, thank you for this fact that you have told us. Jesus, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And help all of us to know and to find great faith and hope and love in the that you are a person and in this person is all the hope and the faith and the love that we will ever need and one day there will be no need for hope and faith because you will be standing right in front of our eyes thank you for blessing us and also thank you for our trials and tribulations for it is there that we grow in christ's love and name we pray Amen. 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 Thank you, sir. God bless you. Thank you, Paul. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Pine Lander podcast. If you enjoy our unique content, please consider supporting our sponsors. Soft News provides special operations news from around the world. It's where Paul and I go to keep abreast of what's going on within the soft community. Check them out at soft.news. American Partisan is the vanguard movement of Western civilization. Be sure to check them out at AmericanPartisan.org. And, of course, Blacksmith Publishing. We've been serving the warrior class since 2013. They have a great titles written for warriors, by warriors. If you're looking for uh, excellent reference material or just want to enjoy a great novel, be sure to check out the bookstore. Or if you enjoy hanging out with warriors, come spend some time with us in the G-Base over at the Pinelander Podcast. All that's at blacksmithpublishing.com. Until our next meeting, stay mentally and tactically smart, physically and spiritually strong, and socially astute. To each other, we pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. May God continue to bless Pineland. Thank <laughs> you.